but your meditation. Today we're going to be, we have two Apple Ones here that, uh, that we're going to be showing off. Um, this one actually is the one we're going to operate. They're both operational. This particular unit is an NTI unit, which means it's part of the second half of boards that were made. There were 175 boards sold. 100 boards are what we call the, the uh, bite shop boards, though 50 are the ones that people technically consider bite shop because they were of the first 50 batch. There are no serial numbers on these boards. Some boards have a security marker from the bite shop on the back, depending on which store they were sold out of. Now, when they ordered these machines from Apple, they wanted complete computers. Well, Steve Jobs showed up and said, hey, here's, my, here's your 50 computers, pay me. I have to go pay my part supplier. They said, where's the computer? Here. He handed them boards. And uh, it's a famous story that uh, Steve Jobs said, this is an opportunity for you. You can sell your own case and keyboard and power supply. That opportunity is what you see today. They did not sell cases with, with all the first 50. Many people were hardware hackers. So what did they do? They went out and got their own transformers, their own keyboards, and they built their own cases. The bite shop was able to sell some of these cases with some of the later boards. So that makes it a little rarer. Plus, the NTI boards are much rarer because many of them were destroyed by Steve Jobs in the trade-in program for Apple IIs. NTI owners were not the you know, initial, uh, initial buyers, so they tended to uh, not care so much, so they traded in their boards. This board is pretty much all original. Uh, there was one chip that had to be replaced. It was replaced with an identical date code chip. The caps on this machine here, these guys, especially this one, they were elect electrically uh, repaired. So they have been reformed back to as new. The uh, ceramic caps were brought past their curie point from a temperature perspective to reset them. So this board electrically is perfect. When this board was received, it was in very visually poor condition, it was filthy. We didn't know what we had here. This board was chemically cleaned and then neutralized multiple times and what you see here is a beautiful condition board underneath. Very surprising, it is an absolute pristine condition. Better than the board um, that recently sold to Henry Ford, which was pretty scary to me because that board was amazing. I worked on that board as well. Um, this machine has the original cassette adapter. It has the bite shop case. There are very few of these cases, less than a handful around. There are none that we know of that have not been modified re recently seen. On the registry, there are 60 some odd Apple Ones. And of the, the, those in the registry, there are only about 15 that work. To put the board together, to made it to the case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to hook up the electric lines and I'm going to hook up the video. Now, one thing you may notice is this little board here. Now, no, I did not drill new holes. There was actually another board here. I've removed it because it, um, it just was better to have this multiplexer board. I have the original board, but the multiplexer board allows me to, to insert a serial parallel adapter so I can load diagnostic software on while still using the keyboard. But it also allows for the very, very short, the keyboard cable is extremely, extremely short. The problem being, if you plug the keyboard in and you want to open the case, it's going to pull itself out. You'll either damage the cable, the socket, or the plug. So to be safe, you put it on an extension. Now this particular one being a keyboard buffer actually recreates the signal, <clears throat> so it makes it much more reliable to have a longer cable, and it creates a safety point between the keyboard and the, and the board itself, just in case there's any electrical problems here. Though the reset switch for the processor is not recreated, so because the cable is long, sometimes you get a little noise on it, and you have to hold the button down a little bit longer than normal. But when I plug it in straight, it's dead solid. So we've got that in, we'll make sure we're in. We're gonna hook up the uh, video cable. Now the video cable here is not the original. I have the original cable, it goes with the unit. The reason why it's not the original is with the bite shop, with the bite shop case, they, when they ordered the cases, they didn't measure properly. And one of the screws would have actually gone through the venting on the bottom, so through the screen material. So they shifted it back and it hits the keyboard. 
So I was able to fix that. And then why I'm able to close the case now is I've made adapters to slide it over. I have to hook up the power, but I also need to plug in the cassette. The cassette adapters um, were optional. And the cassette adapter, the edge connector, was very commonly broken because people would shove them in. In this case in particular, you would shove it through this hole. There's nothing to support it, and you would crack the connector. So we're going to put a different kind of connector in, and we're going to sneak it out the back hole that's here for the, uh, for the expansion connector. So we use our handy-dandy sonic screwdriver to go out and hook up the power. We all know the sonic screwdriver does not work on wood, so you've got to be careful. So we've got that all hooked up. We're going to uh, put the cassette adapter cable so I can actually load some audio. Now, I'm, I'm not going to use a real cassette player today. I'm going to use an iPhone. I'm doing that for various reasons. One of them is it just makes it a lot easier for me having to rewind back and forward for the demos. But the, I, the iPhone is, and iPods are not as reliable. They're not as loud. As a matter of fact, there's an LED on the back here I'll show you later that um, won't even light up with an iPod or an iPhone because they don't make enough volume. So we fail about 50% of the time on a load, but um, it's a lot easier to, to reload. Whereas a cassette, they kind of stretch over time, so it gets a little more reliable because you got more volume, except that the cassettes tend to be bad. We can make new cassettes, but it's just, you know, when you're loading them a lot for demos, it wears a little. We will hook the power up. I'll make sure it's off. We will hook up the video. I'm just going to push this for safety reasons through a, uh, a clip in the back. And we're going to plug the video in and we're going to get going. We'll power it on. And the Apple One, when you first turn it on, gives you this kind of terminal registry page or terminal blank page. The Rev Zero Apple II did the same thing until uh, they added the auto start ROM in the cassette adapt in the uh, disk drive card. So we go out and we can clear it and we're going to reset the processor. Now we're going to load BASIC, which is also he hand assembled on yellow paper. Woz could not afford an assembler. Uh, it is integer BASIC without all the fancy stuff for graphics and all the other things involved. Um, an Apple One can actually run the checkout program in the Apple One manual, even if it has certain bad bits in the memory, because it just happens that the commands don't use certain bits which uh, means you really can only tell if an Apple One works if you load BASIC or an advanced program. Um, BASIC requires 8K. So the machine came with four, so you bought 8K and you bought a cassette adapter because you had to load it off the tape. So I'm going to go up and load BASIC. Let's uh, clear and reset again. Now, bit of trivia. There is no backspace on an Apple One. Um, if you put an underscore, it will rub out. You can't create an underscore with, an, with a Datanetics keyboard that was sold by the Byte Shop. You can't create an underscore with an Apple II keyboard. Uh, if you press the rub out key, it will make something that looks like an underscore. It's not an underscore. Waz might have been confused. He might have thought it was an underscore and he coded the underscore in the ROM. It's a ROM, we can't reprogram it. Or it's a prom, I should say. Um, he used these proms he got out of the uh, closet at HP. They were used in calculators. So we're going to go out and we're going to load BASIC. It's going to load into um, E0000, and it's 4K long. So one of the neat things about the Apple One is the fact that it's actually a terminal and a CPU that were um, placed onto a single board. So Woz and Jobs had designed a TV typewriter type terminal that works at 300 baud, and they had sold the design to someone prior to them actually forming Apple. What Woz did was he took the design and just added a microprocessor. He actually used um, some tricks with uh, stealing video uh, refresh stuff to kind of refresh the RAM and do other things. So basically, um, this machine is really something prior to the Apple one that would have been on two boards. You'll notice the text, and I'm, and I'm talking like this, so when I show you, is very, very, very slow. It is 300 baud. But an Apple I is actually faster than an Apple II. If I was going to go calculate pi to like 1,000 digits, this will finish first than an Apple II, because all the processor does is actual computer work. The video section is all in hardware. Even things like when, you're, um, when it hits carriage return is done in hardware, so it's extremely fast. So we've got BASIC. 
So I'm going to stop this now and we'll reset. And let's load up Star Trek. This is the same Star Trek that many people bought their computers to play. So it's kind of cool because this is a, um, you know, it has some very significant history to Apple, this program, and I'll explain that while it's loading. So this program was ported from the Creative Computing uh, book by Dr. Wendell Sander. Dr. Wendell Sander went on uh, to create the Apple III. He was the father of the Apple III and also was brought out of retirement to work on the iPhone, the original iPhone. Dr. Wendell Sander, who worked uh, as an engineer designing microchips in the Silicon Valley, uh, was older than Jobs, had, a, had kids, had a house, family, um, came to Steve Jobs and said, hey, look what I did on the Apple I. How's this? Well, Steve Jobs managed to convince him to quit his com comfy job and go work for Apple. He became like employee number 14 or 15. So anyone who doubts Steve Jobs' ability to talk people into things, understand he was able to do that to someone and they actually were just coming to him saying, hey, check out this cool thing I did on your Apple One. So <clears throat> we'll enter basic without erasing the current program. And if we got a clean load, we type run, we get a number, a random number generator. And this is the Star Trek that many people remember from their early days in computing. And here's our program. So once again, kind of nice and slow, it's scrolling past. I'm just gonna reset it and we'll load something else. Now here's funny, I can keep hitting clear, it's still listing. <laughs> I can stop it. So the trick is try not to reset it while you're actually running a list. So we can actually load uh, Apple the 30th, which uh, kind of everyone finds cool because it's ASCII graphics. It's actually a modern program. It was done about 10 years ago. Someone took photographs, they put them into Photoshop, and then they wrote a little loop on, and they did it on their replica one. So kind of cool. Hey, look, there's Waz. So the original monitor that would have been with this is, uh, there's various different ones, but from the bike shop, they were selling a Sanyo VM4209. Um, we have the original VM4209 that came with this, dated 1976. It needs to be recapped. It will get recapped at some point. So they would have been holding the Apple One in this photograph. It's a pretty famous photograph. Let's load Hunt the Wampus. Mouse is one of our docents. And he hasn't had a chance to type in a real Apple One yet, so. I'm sure. As long as he promises not to lean his hands on it, I think we're good. Shoot or move. So usually when you see an Apple One on display, you're, number one, they don't usually let you touch it. Number two, um, you're usually not typing on the original keyboard because there are very few original keyboards around that would have actually been <laughs> mated to it and come with it. You found a pit, didn't you? You fell. <laughs> Nice. So, the Wampus beat the mouse. We say that the board should be, pow should be powered up about every uh, month to every six months, depending upon the, how the temperature is controlled. Um, in 55 to 65% humidity, 65 to about 75 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you can power it up about every six months. Uh, if it's not in that range, then we, we say up so sometimes even as much as every month, it must be powered on for about an hour just to maintain the board. Uh, the keyboard itself, we, say, we tell uh, museums that they should operate every key on the keyboard at least uh, once a month as well. You don't have to have the machine on, it's just to keep, that, to keep any sort of corrosion from forming. Otherwise, the keys will uh, stop working in this particular design.